So in this session, we want to welcome <laughs> Sophia Mitchell is with us this evening. Hi, Sophia. Hi, from you? JPL, you're the person of the moment because, of course, all the, the reason we're here is one month after Perseverance landed. We've talk, been talking to all kinds of extraordinary people, scientists and all kinds of people, astronauts today. But the real glory, the real story is with you guys at JPL. Now, you're a systems engineer at JPL. You were driving, you were a, a driving in inverted commas. We're going to come uh, to talk about driving in a bit. But you were driving the Curiosity rover, the, the previous rover. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But I want to know just how excited were you this time when Perseverance was landing this time? And we'd seen the seven minutes of terror before a few years ago. But this time, extra excitement because we could actually see it with videos. Yeah. We had microphones. It was all bells and whistles. So just just take us through that day. Sure. It was a very nerve wracking day, especially for me. I work on the surface side of things. So I actually didn't have anything to do with entry, descent and landing. That's a different team. So the only thing I could do that day was try not to panic too much and enjoy everything as it happened. So um, one of the things that we have at JPL for good luck is our lucky peanuts. So we had all gone out and bought peanuts. And I actually spent the morning listening to a Spotify playlist that I had made that was Mars themed and making peanut cookies because I nice. just needed to do something with myself. But a um, snack business going on at J. Like, what's the whole <laughs> snack situation? There's like apparently you were saying earlier a free ice cream bin plus. Yeah, peanuts. it's like that's one of, of the benefits of working on a on a um, flight project is that you get free ice cream. Actually, the whole lab gets free ice cream every now and then. But if you work on a flight project, then you get constant free ice cream. But the catch is that there's too much work to do to sit and eat free ice cream all day. So it's Basically. it's a give and take situation. Okay. I don't know. I can multitask. I can eat ice cream while training. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and was this part of what attracted you to the job? Was it the ice cream? Or was it the thought of exploring I, the solar system? You know, I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was five. But interestingly, I've liked ice cream since that same amount of time too. So it could be right. yeah, yeah, this is connection. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, back to that day, it was really an exciting day. And um, I was on three different video chats actually at the same time, one with the larger Mars or larger JPL team. And then one with the specific um, surface, uh, surface sample caching system, sorry, team that I work on. And then also another one with just the gas dust removal tool, which is the instrument that I work on and just our team, which was much smaller. And, um, and then of course getting texts like crazy from friends and family saying, what's happening? What's happening? <laughs> so, um, when it actually was in the atmosphere, I think was probably the most nervous I've ever been. And then when we saw the telemetry, we actually saw the telemetry maybe a minute before they announced it to the world, um, because we were watching it come down live mm. and it was this mixture. It's almost indescribable. It's this mixture of like so much relief and disbelief that it actually worked the second time with a larger rover and also just like total elation that it's finally there and it's finally time to get to work and use all these things we've been working on for years and it was one of the best moments I've ever had it was amazing I mean I'm just amazed I mean because the thing is you must have been planning this rover for how many years I mean obviously even before Curiosity landed this rover would have been conceived and thought of and planned and mm. built and you as well i mean obviously things like bepi colombo the the, the 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 probe that you work on mm. that's going to mercury mm. decades of work and suddenly it's got to deliver at that moment and you've got those seven minutes I mean, before it you're lands. right I, it's got, I, I can't imagine what that's like a whole career basically oh you can spend up. a career working on a single mission you know if you think about mm -hmm. it Columbo, 20 years of planning seven years of journey to Mercury. you know that's a significant portion of someone's career but i think what also is interesting and maybe you have an opinion on this Sophia, is when you start when the when the whole thing is started a, a suite of instruments are selected for a specific set of tasks that are defined but between selecting the instruments and it arriving things change you know you find out new things about the system and and then you have to adapt what you're doing was that the case for the mission that you work on um, so from the GDRT perspective, I've worked on GDRT since 2019. So oh, relative to, this. oh, sorry, gas dust removal tool. So <laughs> it's an instrument at the end of the robotic arm. Um, you can actually see it in the pictures. It looks like that big black ball that you see in some of the photos. Um, mm -hmm. That's the gas dust removal tool. So that's us. What does it um, do? It puffs nitrogen. So we have, that's a tank of really highly compressed nitrogen. And it, um, we move the nitrogen through what's called a plenum, which is like a holding chamber to make sure that we're puffing the same amount onto the surface each time. 
And then it cleans off rocks that we're interested in. Ah. And then also if we abrade on the rock, so if we kind of scrape away some of the surface to see what's really under there, then we can puff away the abrasion. So then when the instruments go look at it, they're not seeing whatever fell from the sky over the last million years. They're seeing what, what the rock actually is. Ah. So um, GDRT seems simple and doesn't get a lot of attention sometimes, but it ends up being important to the instruments when it's, it's time to go. my favorite tool on the, on the <laughs> I used to like the helicopter, but I'm not, I'm all about the <laughs> But I can see it's like you go, when you pick up a yeah, totally. you to, it makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so part of putting together all these instruments is trying to think of how do we simulate a geologist? If we were to send someone to Mars, we'd probably want to send a geologist because then they know what they're looking at. So how do we simulate a geologist with a robot? And so that's kind of the purpose of all these instruments. And yes, things change in the landing position for the rover changes over time. We definitely don't know where we're going to land it until long after all the instruments have been decided on. So, um, we kind of have this overall purpose of what are we looking for on Mars? So we're looking for signs of past life, signs of, building blocks that we know, at least on Earth, usually are uh, associated with life. And so if I were a geologist looking for that somewhere on Earth, what would I be using? Let's go talk to geologists, see what they use. And that's kind of how you get started with what kinds of instruments do we want to put on this robot. So no matter where it goes, it has something that's relevant for what we want to do. And, well, and actually, this is a question that you asked uh, earlier on. The, the difference mm. between Gale Crater, which is where MSL landed, Curiosity Rover landed, and Jezero mm. Crater, where we are now, just tell us the, the, the difference in terms of the mission parameters. Why Gale Crater then and why Jezero now? Right. So when we picked Gale Crater, we still had uh, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers working on Mars. So those are the two much smaller robots that were solar powered that um, landed in 2004 and five, I believe, and worked for up to 15 years. I think Opportunity was 15 years old when it um, stopped working. <laughs> so I'm a little bit sad still about that. But it's a polite um, way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, and actually a lot of my coworkers worked on both of those robots as well. But anyway, um, they found the initial signs that there actually was evidence of water on Mars before those robots found that in the early yeah. 2000s, we really didn't have good information if there had previously been water on Mars or not. So once they confirmed that, then we started looking at these craters and these signs of, you know, that looks like water, but is that really where water could have been? You know, if it carved out a little canyon, is that what we think it is? If now we have the information that there was water there at one point, then that helps us narrow down where we'd like to put rovers. So the Curiosity rover was threading that needle of where do we think there was rover or there was water? And also um, where can we land the rover? Because in 2012, you know, technology had only come so far. And so while we were using some forms of um, artificial intelligence to pick out the landing site as we came down from the sky, it still had some limits. And so we had to pick a landing spot that was, you know, a bit larger. So we had to go for a larger crater. And so some of the more interesting ones with little river deltas um, yeah. were out of the question in 2012. So that's part of how we ended up at Gale Crater. And of course, there was a whole conference and conversations and <laughs> process that goes on to pick it. But oh. um, Gale Crater was an impact crater. And um, then we believe it filled with water about 3.8 billion years ago. So um, it was a lake for a long time, and then eventually the water left for whatever reason, and maybe during that time period, there was life in it. The difference with Jezero Crater, even though it's another crater, um, and it may have had water in it, it's different because it's actually made from two impacts, we believe, and it's much smaller, and also there are river deltas in it. And so if anybody's ever read about archaeology on Earth, where we tend to find lots of fossils and things that are really well preserved, that tends to be in river deltas because of the silty sand and the way that uh, that sediment is constantly being piled on top of things and moving water. So Jezero Crater is really exciting because unlike Gale, we have all these evidence of mo moving water, bringing soil from you know upstream to cover things up and maybe we'll find something in that layer. So, um, but we couldn't land there in 2012. And now that technology has improved, we could land there. So um, the, the pinpoint yeah. landing that you did was just extraordinary. I mean, it was much more sophisticated, you know, just just the kind of the area that you, you could land. I mean, it was down to because I mean, it could make decisions as it was landing. It's like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to miss that bit and go and land over there. 
Exactly. I'm constantly in awe of the entry, descent, and landing team. I think that what they do is incredible. It, it, it seems off like now. magic. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I think they're actually showing off. They've sort of got it. <laughs> kind of, I mean, even things like we can they think, oh, we're going to save secret messages into the parachutes. That's showing off. I thought it? that was great, it was actually. Great. It I was thought great. It was super but interesting. Did you know about that? Because I, I like all these little Easter eggs that you JPL people put on your rovers. Mm-hmm. We put a lot of Easter eggs. There's Easter eggs on Curiosity too. Um, check out that's the my favorite wheels. one. Look, mm-hmm. the JPL and Morse code. Tell, in the tell us about it. Tell yeah, us tell about us that about one. It. This is my favorite one. Yeah. So actually, there's a reason for that too. It's not just that we were playing around, although it is a little bit. Um. So <laughs> when we were driving, <laughs> when we were driving Spirit and Opportunity, um, one of the things that the drivers noticed was that if we drove through a lot of sand, it was difficult to tell how much we were slipping, especially if there weren't a lot of rocks to take pictures of nearby. One of the things that we use is called visual, visual odometry. So as we drive, we take pictures of the ground. And then as the rover moves forward, we take another picture and say, well, that's odd. I thought I moved forward and the rock should have been going from here to here, but instead it's way over there. I must've split. <laughs> but if okay. there's no rock to look at, it's very difficult to make that comparison. So um, one of the upgrades for the Curiosity rover was having something on the wheels so that we would always have something to look at as we drove. So worst case, if we're in a giant sand pit, we can just look behind us and see the wheel tracks. So um, we were thinking, well, what? Well, I wasn't on the team at the time, but they were thinking, what what could we put on these wheels that would be easily identifiable and that we can potentially have the cameras automatically find? And um, so some boxes and squares was an idea. And that turned into, well, we can use boxes and squares to make Morse code. And that's why now as Curiosity drives around Mars, it's printing JPL over and over and over <laughs> all over the it. planet. I love it. That's I great. love it. Yeah, so it's... we have a question from the chat, actually. You mentioned sure. the instrument that you work on. And, and this person has just been asking, has your part been used yet? So have you switched on your instrument yet? We've switched it on and taken some pressure readings of the uh, of that supply tank, but we haven't actually used it yet because we're still doing all the checkouts required before we can use most of the system. Uh, it takes a really long time to do all these checkouts. And then also we've been a little bit busy because the Ingenuity helicopter will be flying very soon. So what? we had... To- Oh, no, sorry, carry on. I didn't trip. Oh, that's okay. Um, So one of the things that we're doing right now is preparing for that, which includes dropping the belly pan off of the rover so Ingenuity can drop down to the surface because we carried her there on uh, Perseverance's stomach, basically. And um, and then driving away from that spot and getting far enough away that if something happens with Ingenuity, it won't maybe run into the rover. (laughs) So um, That would be awful if you sort of like did a a (laughs) three-point reversed over it. Uh. (laughs) Just uh, just the... Well, I, we're gonna. I, I, we should actually. How on earth do you drive a rover on Mars? This is, yeah. this is the question that everyone yeah. knows. Now, you're not driving Perseverance, but you were driving Curiosity. So, just mm-hmm. take us through your kind of experience from working in. So, you you know, you practice in the Mars yard at JPL. I know you've got a, a, a sort of analog rover called Maggie that you drive around in. Just take us from that to then driving on Mars. How does it work? How does one do it? So it's a very long training process. We actually have classes. So if you thought school was over by the time you got to JPL, you have to do classes sometimes. So it's about a year and a half to two years of training, um, weekly classes, doing labs, homework, but it's learning. You have to learn how the entire system works. So the whole mobility system, the whole robotic arm system, you have to kind of know those things inside and out because we're not just responsible for, you know, let's go over there and marching that way. We have to make sure the rover stays safe and that what we're telling it to do is actually safe. And, um, you know, science will say we need to go way over there. And if it's not safe to go there, we have to be able to push back with good reason. So um, so that's part of what takes so long. And the other part is just getting that feeling for driving a rover. And the way I've based my feeling for where I want to drive is because I'm an avid backpacker. So when I look at the images of Mars and when we get them back, they actually have data in each pixel so we can make a 3D mesh of the surface. And then I have these 3D glasses that I put on <laughs> and ah, I get nice. to look at the surface <laughs> and Wait, it looks like I'm standing there. <laughs> what do you have the 3D glasses for? For looking at the surface of Mars. So we have these pictures that come back and they um, have the, you know, the red blue size for each of the pixels so we can see the surface in three dimensions while we plan on driving. That's amazing. so you can so you can say oh look there's a rock over there we better not we better not are these them. images released yeah, or a little hill can I, can I find them anywhere so I can put 3D glasses on and pretend I'm on Mars some of them are and I am sad that I don't have that link for you right now but they are online <laughs> we can, we can, we can search for it 
And but okay, yeah. how so the, the the big question is how do you then make the rover go? So okay, we want to go over and look at that rock over there. What mm -hmm. is just talk us through the kind of process of that? You don't have I'm guessing you don't have a joystick or anything. It's not like a remote. No. Thing. Right. So we can't joystick anything on Mars. And, and that's the reason why, you know, when we land, it's all autonomous because Mars is really far away. It's seven light minutes away in one direction. So if you were to try to joystick something, you wouldn't understand if it did what you told it to do until 14 minutes later at best. But because no orbits are circular, sometimes it's 22 minutes away. So we can't count on that to try to drive a rover. And sometimes Mars is behind the sun and we can't even see it. So what we do instead is write these sequences in a really specific programming language that we have at JPL for the rovers. And um, so we come in first thing in the morning, we get all these pictures down, put on the glasses, see where we are. And then the scientists will come up and say, that over there looks really interesting, but it's very far away. On the way there, let's check out this outcrop of rocks because there's all these layers. And one thing about exploring Mars is that we love rocks with layers in them because it's like reading a storybook of what happened in that period of time. So, um, so they'll say, we wanna go that way, but first let's go this way. So we'll think, okay, how do I get there safely with the rover? And so that's where that three dimension and uh, hiking background comes in for me at least, because I would think if I were hiking, where would I put my feet? Obviously not over a big cliff or you know somewhere where I can't see where my feet are gonna go. So I have to make sure the rover's wheels do the same thing. They only go in places where we can see what's there and on rocks that are smooth and not through really deep sand that'll get us stuck. And um, so we plan out that path and then there's some back and forth with the scientists. And then um, we package that up into the sequence and then get it sent to Mars. So do you have a backup plan? Like what if you were to having have a small experience of driving a rover in a Mars yard and getting it stuck in a sand dune? Uh, what if you were to drive it into a sand dune and it was to get a little bit stuck? Like what's, is there a backup plan? Is there some way to get it out? Or is that just, you know, that's the end of the whole thing? So we have some ideas and that actually did happen to one of the other rovers. I think Opportunity got stuck in some sand for a little bit and they were able to figure out a way to kind of shift it back out like you might <laughs> with a car at the beach that you parked in a spot you weren't supposed to. So <laughs> there's you know ways that we would work on that. But um, generally we know the limits of the rover based on a lot of ground testing that happened before it landed on Mars. So we have an idea of where not to go because we know we'll get into that situation. So the rover drivers are trained to be pretty conservative and not put us there. But we sure. do have anomalies sometimes, so it happens. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in terms of your Mars yard and your practice center, um, presumably you have rocks that kind of simulate the environment on Mars, but um, I, I guess maybe we don't know the, the sort of exact situation you're going to find yourself in. Maybe the, maybe the Mars yard isn't an exact replica of what you find. And I'm thinking in my mind now about the... Um, about the insights mission which was going to drill yes. down and, and <laughs> was right and they couldn't do it and so you know that kind of makes me think well maybe there are things we don't know about about the martian surface and yet right yeah that's always true and i actually worked on the test bed for the mole for insight okay. as a co-op and i was so sad because we had this three meter tall simulated mars sand you know tube that we were testing the mole in and then we landed and that just wasn't what was on <laughs> mars so that's that's how it works sometimes sometimes science doesn't give you what you expected and that's part of the fun I'm, I'm but quite yeah when, when you said oh you know scientists tell you things and then you go off and do it yeah. is it like one scientist is it like a kind of like an army of scientists like <laughs> pounding on the door saying you've got to go over there and then the chemist saying no that rock's rubbish we want to go over to that rock like, so we we let them do that fight in a different room, and then they send one to come talk added, to us. Added room where, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some like old medieval swords and oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they joust. <laughs> and some kind of like some water diviners. To keep the, Everyone's everyone have um, just very quick. I've got a, a, a question. Oh, we sort of answered this. This is from Graham Sutcliffe. Sorry, Graham. We sort of answered your question already. How do you deal with the time delay between Earth and Mars when trying to instruct? the rover's movement where well, you sort of touched on that but is it I mean is it you say sometimes it's you know it's a 22 minute delay sometimes it's a seven minute delay how does it do you sort of factor in that delay with your coding like how does how does it all work so the sequence arrives all at once at Mars so right. there's not any delay when the sequence is actually running um, yeah. We also have passes where we've planned when different orbiters are going to be over the rover. And so we have expected times when data is going to be coming back down from Mars. And for the Curiosity rover, since it's much older, we know the system really well, and we're 
more confident in working with that system on this terrain, then we're happy to have a normal, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. workday and just have data come down when it comes down and work with it as we can. But for Perseverance, because it's a brand new rover and it's in a new location, we actually go on what's called Mars time, where we are seeing the data come down with every single pass that we can get. And, um, and we wake up on Mars's schedule for where the rover is on the planet and go to bed with it too. And so mm-hmm. what makes that difficult is that the Martian day is 40 days or the Martian day is 40 minutes longer than the Earth day. Nice. So every day for the sport <laughs> team, they have to shift their wake That's up in bed time. Today is 40 minutes long, <laughs> just today. It feels like <laughs> is it, I've got a question. Is it, you know, when you, if you buy a new car on Earth, you know, brand new car and you're really excited. So you have to drive it really carefully so you don't scr- sc- but your old car, you can sort of razz about a bit. It doesn't matter if it gets scr- <laughs> Is it a bit like that with curiosity? Is everyone, can you sort of take a, be a bit less conservative with curiosity now and go and do fun stuff? I don't want to say less conservative, I, I, but it, it definitely <laughs> feels like, you know, the, the older child that the parents are yeah. looking more at the baby right now kind of yeah, situation yeah. where <laughs> we're, still, we're still responsible. But yeah, it's like, oh, well, we're going to just do that. Don't worry about us. And <laughs> uh, We've got millions of questions. Yeah, I'm going to ask one, actually, okay. which is about software. So there's a question here that says, um, can you update the software that you're running? Is that a risky thing to do? How often can you do it? Is it even possible? Yeah, so, yeah, that Dallas, would, dri- we- that would drive you know, you would get nervous. Well, the if, thing if you is, you know, when your computer, you turn your computer on, it starts nagging you for software updates, and then you update <laughs> and it crashes and it all falls apart, and then you call up tech support. And, <laughs> oh, it's awful. Is it do things work better on um, with your software than, than Apple? <laughs> Fortunately for us, because it's in house software, we get to decide when that annoying pop up comes. Right. So um, we do update the software. We update the flight software once every few years um, with you know new capabilities that we've developed on the ground. We still have the constraint of what the computers on the rover are able to do because you have to remember they're from 2010. So things have come a lot further now, and Curiosity can only do so much. So that's part of one of the other reasons why Perseverance is great right now. But um, we do update that flight software, but more frequently we update the sequences that we use because we can just upload a new sequence, have it delete the old one, and there we are. So um, that was really important when the feed extended feed the feed extended drill that we have on the rover broke in 2016, and we actually had to reinvent how to drill on Mars. And I was part of that team, and um, so you can imagine if we we can't touch the rover, obviously it's on Mars. So if we also couldn't update the software and the algorithms that it uses to drill, we would just be finished. We wouldn't be able to get any sample. So being able to update those sequences and write new ones and send them to the rover to work was really important for making that happen. That's amazing. Here, there's a question here from, this is from Owen Jones. Actually, this is a, this will take about an hour to answer. <laughs> um, so Let's go. <laughs> he, wants know, he wants to know what's your background. And I think that's a really good question because it's basically you've got the coolest job on the planet. It's like, if you kind of, it's like, well, I drive rovers on Mars. How on earth do you get to drive rovers on Mars? Like where did, for you, did it all begin? Sure. So um, there's no specific In two minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm condensing. So there's there's no specific path to becoming a rover driver. Um, one of the great things about our team is that we have such a diversity in our backgrounds because I have a aerospace engineering controls background, but also have done a lot of geology work and making um, simulated rocks for other missions. And so that interaction of the robot with the Martian surface is kind of my specialty, but somebody else on the rover will have worked a lot on power systems and be an electrical engineer. And so they make a good rover planner for that, you know, that background. So um, really the main thing is just following what you're passionate about because you have to do a lot of it. (laughs) You have to be ready to do it (laughs) all the time. I was up until, you know, one in the morning last night doing my job, but I'm happy to do that because I love what I do so much. So getting into more of my background specifically, um, I grew up in the state of Kentucky, so it's kind of in the middle of the U.S., and um, I went to the University of Cincinnati, which is in Ohio, and got my my bachelor's degree and master's degrees in aerospace engineering. And a big thing that I did that I would recommend everybody do is I got very into my science fair project. Um, It's a lot of my research started out in the sixth grade when I had a science fair project that it was just on like when hair breaks after being put in different types of water. And I got to the science fair and my teacher was saying, you know, this doesn't have a good purpose. And I know that now she probably just might rewrite it. But at the time I was really thinking like, 
how are we going to use when hair breaks from different water to help humanity? Like, what is that actually <laughs> doing for us? And also why would I do this? Because I love space. So I started trying to think of how I could actually bring space and the scientific process that I was learning in school together. And so for my next year's science fair project, I was trying to compare the number of sunspots that we could count on the sun to the temperature on the earth, because I had learned about, you know, the solar cycle. And, um, and there wasn't a good correlation, but it was just the idea of doing all this research. And I ended up doing international science fair and having that research background then enabled me to do research later in high school and start into college doing research right away. And that made me stand out. So when JPL came to the University of Cincinnati looking for two or three interns to bring back to the lab with them, I was able to make myself stand out with that research. So I highly recommend, it doesn't matter what you're interested in, research it. It's a lot of fun and you just get to ask crazy questions and try to answer them. I mean, what's more fun than that? So it's quite interesting <laughs> as well that a, a kind of a, a negative comment from a teacher or something that you perceived as a negative comment from a teacher. <laughs> it wasn't a negative comment whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. It just fueled your amazing yeah, career. Yeah. I got so mad. I think one of the I worked so hard. And <laughs> yeah. Well, there you are. So. <laughs> I think one of the questions that people have been asking on the chat as well is um, about the instruments on board's perseverance. So can you tell us a bit about, you don't have to describe every instrument in detail, but kind of some of the key instruments that are involved and, and what the science that they're going to do hopefully will be. Yeah, so on uh, Perseverance, we have, of course, GDRT. And then we also have um, Pixel, That's our which is, right, of course. <laughs> then we have Pixel, which is an instrument that uses a radioactive element in its sensor to um, excite some of the molecules on the surface that when we hold the sensor over the surface, then these molecules give off different um, signatures. And so it will sense kind of without having to really dig in and you know bring the rock into a whole laboratory, some of the initial components of a rock. So if we say, oh, is that rock made of a lot of clay because we like clays, they have you know sometimes organic compounds in them, then we can put pixel over it and be able to tell really quickly if we should spend our time with this rock or move on to something else. Mm. So Pixel is really cool. Um, there's also Sherlock and um, Sherlock has Watson. And um, so it's, <laughs> it's Watson is the camera and Sherlock is the instrument. <laughs> and um, so the purpose of those instruments is again, the photography up close of these rocks and um, it can get really high quality images and three-dimensional images. If you've ever seen the really close up pictures of um, Mars from the Curiosity rover, we have an instrument called Molly. So uh, that takes those images on the end of the robotic arm. So um, Sherlock and Watson are kind of the upgrade of Molly so that we can investigate rocks more. Um, then there's also, of course, the coring mechanism. So the main purpose of the Perseverance rover is to seal rock samples and sand samples in these tubes and then drop them off. If anybody's ever gone geocaching where you have to go find the coordinates of some prize. That's essentially what Perseverance is putting down around Mars. It's gonna have little piles of sample tubes with different types of rocks that we found interesting. And then another rover can come later, find those sample tubes and then send them back to earth. So to get the samples in those tubes, we have a core that um, drills into rocks that we think are cool and seals them up and then drops them out of the belly. Um, let's see. Oh, of course, we also have Supercam, which is the giant laser on top of the rover's head. So uh, Curiosity also has a giant laser on top of its head. That's one of the coolest things about the rovers is that we just drive around <laughs> and shoot things with a laser. But um, what it does is when it shoots rocks that are far away with the laser, then it takes a really quick photo right after that with um, a spectrograph in it. And so then the, um, the light that comes off of that interaction um, the spectra from that light, so like the different wavelengths that you see, um, can tell us more about what that rock is made of. And um, so they like to use that to see from far away where we can't just go put pixel everywhere we want to see. We can shoot right. things with the laser yeah. and get an idea that way. And we also shoot the sky too. Sometimes they do that to study the atmosphere. Oh, nice. So you mentioned some cameras there, and I think you actually might have some little selfies that, that Perseverance took. Can you share those with us? Because I'd love to see a selfie yeah. of well, you, yeah, people are, well, always, people are always like, how the heck do they take a picture of itself? Yeah, That's we it. want so, to know this. You know, it's like, how, <laughs> yeah. so how do you do that? Who took that photo? Was it the alien that took the photo? <laughs> oh, the back to you. How did that work? <laughs> so this is actually a picture, a uh, selfie from Curiosity. We don't have any Perseverance selfies yet, but we will once we start using the robotic arm a bit more after uh -huh. the uh, helicopter month. 
but let's share my screen. When is, oh, we should all, when is helicopter day, by the well, way? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. All oh, right, look. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so this yeah. is a video that we took of how we take our selfies that everybody sees. So what you're seeing is a, uh, basically we took a picture every time the robotic arm moves to take another picture that we then Photoshop together to make our selfies, which is why you never see the robotic arm in our selfies, by the way, because it's busy taking all these photos. So in order to get this video though, we use the cameras on the mast of the robot. So the you know thing that looks like a neck and the little eyeballs. Um, and every time the robotic arm moved for another photo, we took a picture and made this GIF. That's but what's amazing. really, yeah. And what's really cool, the way you get this fisheye lens effect in our yeah. selfies is because you can put your finger on the screen and see how Molly, which is our camera, and that's that little, you know, shiny disc yeah. is just rotating around a certain point in space. And that's how we get um, kind of a fisheye lens view of the rover. Yeah, that is, they're amazing. It's funny. I mean, you look at those pictures now and that they, it looks like it's on Earth. It's that's, incredible. It's, it's, yeah, still, I still get freaked amazing. out when I look at these Mars pictures. Yeah. And, Totally. And it's like, well, that mountain in the background, it could be anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you mentioned it's, helicopter. It's so you mentioned helicopter month. Maybe we can have your face big on the screen again so we yes. can see you again. Sophia. Sure. Yes. Oh, yeah. Marsha. Oh, oh, I just saw a slide on Marsha. <laughs> I had other surprises on just, here, but we can just, talk just, about just, helicopters. Too. Helicopter. They're getting all the headlines of the helicopters. So, well, I think we need to hear a bit about the helicopters. Let's hear a bit yeah. about the helicopters. So tell us about helicopters sure. on, on Mars. How does that work? So uh, Mars's atmosphere is only 1% of the Earth's atmosphere by density. So Mars has the super thin atmosphere. It's a, a much smaller planet, so it wasn't able to hold on to it. And then also it's made of different elements. So as an aerospace engineer, um, that makes sense to me that you would have to design a, a helicopter completely differently for that atmosphere at that density and made of different things than you would for a helicopter on Mars with a much higher density made of mostly nitrogen and oxygen. So, um, it was really difficult to test this helicopter, as you can imagine, because we have to try to develop something for a place that we can't truly simulate on Earth. And so that's part of what makes this so exciting. Yeah. Um, but one of the things about this helicopter is that the rotors rotate in opposite directions mm -hmm. at 2,500 rotations per minute RPM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's extremely fast compared to, you know, if you've right. ever flown a helicopter, you don't spin them quite like that, um, especially for something, you know, this big. But um, yeah, that's what's required to generate enough lift to actually fly it. But this is really exciting because it's the first time that we're flying a rotary propelled vehicle on a different planet, not even just Mars, but any other planet. And um, so that's a huge first. And maybe now in the future, we'll be able to send other little, you know, UAVs to go fly yeah. around between different places or help the rovers see over those hills we can't see on our own do, and things like do that. We, do we have a date for it? Because I mean, everyone is really, really anxious to see these pictures. The yeah. first, and are we going to see the pictures <laughs> streamed sort of as live when you get the pictures or will, will, they, will they sort of be released later? Because I know everyone's chomping at the bit, really. Right. With all the excitement, I'm sure that there will be things released as soon as we can. Um, I don't know the exact date that the helicopter will be flying yet. But um, it'll be, you know, probably within the next month or so. Um, we call it Heli Month, which is when we're getting ready to fly it, and that's definitely coming up. So um, just keep your keep your ears open, and it'll be happening soon. But yeah, I can't give you I, I, an exact date right now. No, no problem. But I mean, I guess the other thing I want to ask. So we call it a helicopter, but the size that you indicated looked a bit more drone-like. So mm -hmm. kind of how high? How high can this thing go in the atmosphere? The atmosphere is going to change with height. And so I guess you have to worry about that. How high can it get? How much of the crater will it see? Um, so I don't know the specifics on height for the helicopter because I've just been working on the GDRT. Oh, no, sorry. I know this is so, hard. Oh, it's OK. I just haven't, I haven't looked up all of this. But um, obviously, yes, it can't you know, go way high up to like 20,000 feet. That's not going to happen. So it can probably, I would assume, I don't want to put a good number, but you know. Sure. Well, actually, this kind of leads to my next question. As a as a rover driver, I'm wondering whether if you might use the data that comes back from the little drone to try and work out kind of a good route to navigate through to try and avoid all the obstacles that that might sort of trap you. Is that the kind yeah. of thing we do? Yeah, we might do that for sure. There's uh, imaging equipment all over the helicopter, so for sure, if we can fly it to um, locations where we want to drive the rover in the future and kind of check things out before we get there, that would be amazing. So um, yeah, we definitely will use whatever data we can get from Ingenuity on Perseverance. 
One thing I've been wondering about, because you've, you've, you know, you've got five rovers up there on Mars now, and every time you do anything on Mars, the question of, are we going to find life? Are we going to find signs of ancient life? What is the kind of gut feeling at JPL? I mean, about getting a positive return of, of, of signs of ancient life? You know, because this is this is this is the primary mission of this particular rover, and it's the first time it has been the primary mission. So there, mu- it seems to me, there must be some kind of, yeah, we're pretty sure we're going to get, it. otherwise we <laughs> wouldn't spend three billion dollars <laughs> sending another rover. For sure, yeah. There's definitely a lot of optimism, um, especially because of all of the data that we've gotten from these previous rovers. And from Curiosity, we've sensed a methane cycle for the first time yeah. that we see on Earth. And there can be geologic reasons for that, but there can also be bacterial reasons for that. And um, so obviously, we're not thinking that we're going to find, you know, little green people running around all over the surface. Well, that would be neat. <laughs> that would be neat. And you would know because none of us can keep that secret. But, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're mostly looking for signs of ancient types of life. So, you know, if in a rock, we could find a, um, a molecule that's a product, a known byproduct of something that's alive, like a little molecule or a little bacteria. That's the kind of things we're looking for. And, um, yeah, the other things that curiosity have found is like, we found signs of organic molecules, which organics means that it has, um, carbon in it doesn't mean it was alive, but, (laughs) um, organic molecules in some of the rocks at Gale crater. And so, if we believe Jezero Crater may have been even more welcoming to ancient bacterial life than Gale Crater was, then what does that mean about what we'll find here? So there's a lot of excitement about what we'll find when we do start using all of these instruments in Jezero Crater. And um, yeah, that's that's why we keep at it, just because we keep finding really cool things with the science. And so it just keeps us going like, what else can we find? We've only seen a little <laughs> bit of this planet. There's got to be something here. So. I don't know how you guys can wait. You know, you've got to wait how many years before you get these sample returns back. I'd be like, I'd be like, oh my God, I get them now. <laughs> yeah, it might yeah be- it's, I know it's going to be, it'll be the next generation of scientists that get to find, find, get to sort of study those samples. Well, it could be. I mean, what, what was your feeling about how, how long it's going to take to get the samples back? So we've been working on Mars sample return for several years now. In fact, when I started at JPL in 2016, I was working in the Mars sample return test bed on the um, AI or artificial intelligence that we're using to pick up the sample tubes as we find them. So that robot has been in development for some time. And I know there's a lot of European Space Agency involvement as well in that program. And yes, um, I, say, I think didn't I think they were British designs, those tubes. Weren't they designed, I, don't know the tu- made- I don't know about the tubes, but there uh, are definitely instruments designed by, by, by uh, British scientists. Anyway, so there's yes. involvement for sure. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one other thing, too, is we get we get a lot of the, you know, the rah-rah at NASA, but we do work internationally. A lot of these instruments on curiosity, perseverance, um, insight, they're international efforts. And so um, that's always good to remember. But yeah, it's um, it's been in work for a long time, just like perseverance was before curiosity landed. So um, probably within the next decade or so is when we can expect to see the rover get there. But like you said, we also have to get it back. So that's another <laughs> six to eight month trip. Just once we have the, you know, the entire rocket ship loaded up with our samples um, to leave Mars. So it'll be some time, but I think it'll be really worth it. Yeah. I mean, so that's the next big bit of in- infrastructure. There isn't going to be sort of another rover in between. So it's 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 the Perseverance rover now. Then it's the the next sort of lander and the little mini rover, the fetch rover that'll go and get the samples and then rocket mm-hmm. up the orbiter and back home however many years that's going to take. There isn't another main kind of one ton rover in development now, is there? Um, Not that I'm aware of. I think our main focus next is that sample return mission. You're you're not planning any big rovers. Personally, (laughs) I am, but tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Wrong planet. (laughs) I I, I asked this because Murray's put a question. Thank you, Murray Cohen. There are currently five rovers on Mars, two working ones. How many more rovers do you anticipate going to Mars? in the next two or three decades, which is why. I, oh, you know, as many as we can send, I mean. Yeah, let's just keep the <laughs> rovers going. Yeah, I mean, the Rosalind Franklin's going to be Thank you, to... thank you. Yes, Tom mentioned, yeah, yeah Rosalind Franklin, the ExoMars. We'll be heading there in a couple of 2022, I think. So yeah. yeah that's, I guess that's the next And I'm excited about that one, because that, okay, you know, you've got your lasers, sure. Love that. You've got your helicopters, whatever. We, we, uh, the, the Ros and Franklin, we've got a two meter drill. We're going down because mm. we, you know, that's 
I think, important. If you want to find... It is past life oh maybe. but also understand the cross and understand the way i mean you worked on insight didn't you sophia so mm -hmm. but, you know one of the one of the instruments on that was looking at the cross mm. and trying to understand and um, the thermal conductivity of the cross amongst many other things so there's much that we don't know about the martian crust actually and that'll be interesting yes. yeah and, and mars yeah. has the largest volcano in the solar system olympus Mons. so obviously there was volcanic activity which obviously means there was plate tectonics at some time and so looking for mars quakes is another thing that um Insight was trying to do, <laughs> so hopefully this what, what's server happened will be able with to do Is it, Well, I mean, what's the deal with Insight? <laughs> I, I follow it on Twitter, and I get really amazing pictures from Insight. I'm always excited. well. The thing about Mars quakes that was interesting was that there's a couple of ways that you can get Mars quakes, but essentially you can get impacts, and impacts cause shock waves to move through the planet, and then you can measure them, um, and that tells you a bit like when we look at seismic waves on the Earth. So you're looking yeah. at different types of wave that move through different media or don't pass through different media. For example, some can't travel through liquids and all. That kind of thing and then you can sort of triangulate back and you can try and understand a little bit about the interior of the planet in essence now we can't really triangulate because we've only got one point but we're interested in looking at sort of waves that pass through the martian surface caused by impacts or caused by shift in the in sort of the martian structure in essence the structure of mars on the other side um and we can sort of try and look at what the inside of Mars looks like, the structure of the interior of Mars, because there's lots of theories about what it looks like, right, Sophia? There's lots of theories about, oh, it's entirely liquid on the inside, oh, it's a bit of solid, but you really need to sort of do this analysis to work out what the inside looks like, and it's a difficult measurement to make. It is. I get really confused and have arguments with people about why Mars doesn't have a magnetic field, and people have lots of different uh -huh. opinions about why Mars <laughs> <laughs> is it because we don't have a liquid, or we do have a liquid? Well, I think or... we have evidence that it used to have one about four billion years ago, and it switched off, and I think most people are in agreement that there was a global field, and now there isn't. Now we have to be discussing what the impact of having a field would have been and actually, you know, whether it would have been a more habitable place if it had a magnetic field protected its atmosphere perhaps more. And when that switched off, whether that's when everything started to go slightly wrong for, for Mars and it headed in a different direction. And it's still a matter of huge debate actually among, among many mm -hmm. suspect physicists. We do see portions of the Martian surface that have some uh, local fields that, you know, not like a global magnetic field, but little portions of remnant crustal fields that are quite interesting to study. Yeah. Oh no, it's fascinating. So, I, but this is—I mean, our fascination with Mars will never end. It's uh, just, yeah, it's just totally. Since, never. <laughs> since, we, since the Roman times. Uh, oh, just—I mean, here's a question from Sophie. I just want to ask you this, um, with tr three question marks. So it's a big question. Yeah. Why okay. would you drop tubes to let another rover get them? So just ex but perhaps explain for us just the, the sort of um, the details of this sample return, how it actually works. Right. So if we kept the tubes, then you would have to plan the mission completely differently because we would have to hang on to the tubes until either we can send them back on our own, which means that the Perseverance rover, which is our largest rover we've ever landed on Mars, would have also needed to have a rocket on it. Well, that on, so, so, but, would have but, just but, been but, huge. So tube, <laughs> when we say tubes, we mean these are the tubes we put the, the, the Mars samples yes. in. So these are like the test tubes, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. They're sealed little test tubes and right. they're I think maybe this big there, yeah. but the inside is much smaller. So anyway, um, so if we were to hang on to those and try to send them back directly from this rover, it would have had to have been a much larger rover and also have much more technology that we aren't prepared to use on Mars yet, like sending a rocket that we brought with us back to Earth. And actually one of the instruments on Perseverance called MOXIE is a initial, uh, it's one of the initial ways that we're trying to see if we can produce oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere. And that would be great if humans go there, but also it'd be great to make rocket fuel, which is hydrogen and oxygen. So right. um, on the next rover, then maybe there we would be making our own rocket fuel on the surface to send back. So that's one reason why it would be difficult. Another reason is if we waited for that other rover to bring the rocket with it, then are we just going to sit there with the sample tubes? Are we going to go around and sample and hope we remember where they pick, where we picked those samples up from. Um, <laughs> what are the different things that, you know, what, what's the plan for figuring out um, how we got these samples in the first place so we can correlate them back on earth with where they came from. And then on top of that, um, you know, you have to get them from this rover into the rocket somehow. So is it going to then drop them off on the surface and have the other rover pick them up? Or is it going to, you know, hand them to the rocket in some way, which means we'd have to drive all the way back from where we came, went to, to get back to that rocket. So there's all these questions involved. So the, actually the most straightforward way to do it is to, as we go, drop off these samples and then have another rover that comes 
and picks them up and brings them back to the rocket while we continue on doing more science. So yeah, so there's, you know, pros and cons, but that's that's how we got <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> how are we doing for time? I think we're, we're running out of we're time, out actually. Of time. Yeah, we could talk to you for hours, Sophia. Thank you so much for joining us. So interesting. Of course. You know your perspectives yeah it's been a real it's been a real we've got too many questions i know there's loads I, on the I, chat i, we can't I, know, like, yeah, I wish i could spend all day hopefully, hopefully people have got a, sort of a bit of a a clearer idea of um of what you do all day at jpl mainly eating nuts and ice cream that's, well, that's what that's certain, what we've taken away that's a, that's a, that's a, <laughs> um thank you so For much sure. i want to say thank you to everyone as well who's joined us all day from 9 30 i noticed in the chat there's a few people who said, Tina, for example, Tina says, we've been here all day. Emma. Emma. Yeah. And uh, uh, Greya, thank you. Uh, Shirley, Shirley. So many. Kate, they've all been with us all day long. We've been here since 9.30. Thank you so much. That's some resilience. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to say a few thank yous as well. Firstly, I want to thank the UK Space Agency, yep. uh, Ezro, Ezro. I want to thank NASA. I want to thank ESA. Or everyone who's contributed to our sessions today. We've had panels, we've had people coming in yes. from all sorts of places to talk to us. Volunteers. Fantastic. Thank so you very, very much indeed. Thank you to everyone. We're, we want to talk to Jim. We're restarting the show. We'll start again. <laughs> there we go. Bouncy, let's go. <laughs> I could do this all day. This was very fun. No, I, yeah. <laughs> so could we. We've been doing it all day. Hi. Hey, it's Jim. Hey, <laughs> Well, we missed you with Andy Aldrin. And, and that... Well, I was on. Uh, you just couldn't find me, apparently, or I logged in in a way that uh, oh, I just okay. was a face in the crowd. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we missed you. Anyway, we missed you. We, but we showed we showed our video that we did yesterday, so it was lovely to lovely to have your contribution. We've just had a lovely chat with. Yeah, that worked out great. Yep, yep, yep. So yeah, you know, I gave a talk to a uh, an astronomy uh, club uh, in Salt Lake uh, last night, and I gave a talk about perseverance. It was an hour long, and then I answered questions for another hour and a half. I got <laughs> I got off at midnight. <laughs> When I got up in the morning, I could hardly talk, and I thought, oh. "My God!" I realized we've still got we it. Worth it. We've still got seventy-four people on this yes. on this chat. So, for the seventy-four people here, this is Dr. Jim Green, head of science at NASA. What, what more can we give you? We've got Sophia, Rover Driver, and the head of science at NASA. So, uh, the one of the questions I just wanted to comment on is, uh, "Why are we dropping the samples?" So, I was involved in that decision. All ah, right. nice. Oh, Tell yeah. us. So, so the concept is, uh, okay, if we put them in a can and we're driving around in the rover, then uh, another rover's got to come and interface with Perseverance to, to pull the can out. That's going to have to be another NASA mission. 
if we drop them on the ground, any nation can pick them up. Ah. Nice. Mm. Okay. Then on top of that, of course, um, it sounds like, well, how hard would it be if they're strewn all over the place? It turns out, uh, I call it the yellow brick road. All you have to do with this rover is you would land it, roll over to where Perseverance was, and follow the yellow brick road. Follow the route Perseverance took because we have enormous amount of information, all kinds of high resolution imaging. You know, you could just literally have it go hundreds of meters, you know, in, in a day. Uh, rather than work so hard to get it to go 20, 30, 40, 50 meters in one day, you can just automate the whole process. That's such a good point and very true. Yeah, that's one of the things we've been able to take advantage of when we double back on our route with curiosity is that we already have all this data from that area and we know how the wheels interact with these parts. So we can just drive right back over. It's a lot faster. Yeah, a lot faster. Now, now, I don't mean to you know, put you out of business. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, uh, but, it, but at least you don't have to, you know, struggle uh, to try to find a new route to get the samples where you think they might be. You know they're on the path and you know where we dropped them because you'll have images of them. So that's the best way to go. Brilliant. There you go. Hey, listen, Susie and I, we've, we've got a, our next panel we've got to jump on in, in five minutes. So we're going to have to jump on this one. But I'm happy. I mean, if you guys want to keep chatting or Tom, if you're there, if you want to do, do some more questions. Yeah, if Tom can throw some sure. questions at us, I, you know, uh, yeah. we could yeah, answer. Are, we're going to have to go and do our YouTube thing. Yeah, now, I'm so sorry. We're going to miss you, Jim. We wanted to talk to you more. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Hey, listen, Jim, I just love talking to you so much. It's yeah. both brilliant. And you, Sophia, so as fun. well. It's just been super fun and and you know, you've really made today. It's been such yeah. a treat having oh, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she's fantastic, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when we did our gravity assist and I was talking to her, I knew exactly who I wanted to recommend uh, when, when really? Mars Day came up, uh, you know. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, you. this is us signing off. We'll do our final thing for Space Rocks for the European Space Agency. And uh, thank you, NASA. Thank you, JPL. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sophia. Yes, wonderful. Our story. pleasure. See you soon. Bye. 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 So yeah, right. we've, we've got loads of questions still. If you're you're happy to answer them, um, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So uh, one of them is um, about uh, in terms of the the sample tubes. Um, how do you ensure that there's no earth bacteria on them um, when you bring them? You know, when you send them out to Mars and bring them back again. Well, the tubes in particular were sterilized, both on the inside and the outside. So um, uh, we worked really hard that anything that touches the surface of Mars, you know, is, is going to be um, free as, as best as we can do it of any Earth microbes. So um, uh, once they're laying on the surface, they'll also be exposed to ultraviolet radiation uh, that will kill off anything we think, uh, or mostly, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, human microbes that may hit your eye, find a way somehow to get on a tube. Uh, but if it's laying on the ground and it's exposed to the ultraviolet radiation, they don't last too long. You have to have a very resilient microbe to be able to make it through that. So the probability we bring back our own microbes is very, very low. But I can tell you this, we will know that because we can DNA sequence it and see that it's us, all right? So we'd be looking for something that hasn't had the same evolution as our life. And that's an important point. If life started on Mars, even if we both started together with the same basic DNA structure, we will have evolved differently because the environments are different. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And just in terms of the, the clean rooms and things that you use there, mm -hmm. what's, it, what's it been like with, with COVID and everything? Is it, I know, because you, obviously you have to use certain measures anyway, what extra kind of things have you had to do to, to make sure things could still happen in the current, like the last year or so? 
So our, our timing lucked out a bit with the clean room because we were pretty much sending the rover to um, Florida by the time that COVID hit JPL. So the clean room still, however, is extremely clean. I mean, when you, you go through a whole training to be able to go into the clean room and you see the people in those white bunny suits is what we call them with a hat and glasses and a face mask and everything. And that's again, just to make sure that not even, you know, a little bit of skin falls onto something that will then contaminate what, you know, Mars with human DNA. So um, when you suit up to go into that room, you put all these sterilized clothes on and you go through a room that blows you with a bunch of air and does that a couple times, cleans it out. Then you go in the clean room. And what's cool about the clean room is that it has a constant airflow from the ceiling through the floor. And that's to make sure that even after all of that cleaning process you've gone through once you're in there, if something maybe got in, it still can clean it out of the air while you're in there. And um, clean rooms are rated with parts per million of you know how much dust or how many things are in the air. And so if you're out in the countryside, it might be like 10,000 parts per million, it's pretty large. And the cleaner at JPL, I think is a hundred parts per million, I think. So it's extremely clean, orders of magnitude cleaner than what you would have outside. And that's, you know, we go to those great lengths to ensure that the rover stays clean and then we package it all up in that clean room and then it gets shipped in that packaging and then unpackaged in another clean room in, in Florida to get put onto um, the launch ro rocket and then packaged up again before it gets launched into space. So um, yeah, we, we go through pretty great lengths to make sure. And then also the inside of those sample tubes, I believe, are some of the cleanest surfaces that we've ever made. Um, it went through several iterations where we thought they were clean and did some inspections and said, you know what, there's still little bits of things in there. Clean them again, because not only are we trying to make sure that we didn't put anything in those sample tubes, we have to make sure that parts of the sample tube don't break off into our sample. And then we think that there's some metal there that's not really there, it's the tube itself. So um, yeah, a lot of work went into making sure that what we get back in these sample tubes is really just gonna be the things from Mars. So. And we, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, the ExoMars mission. Uh, how is that, maybe this is a question for Jim, but how is that different from the Perseverance mission and Curiosity? What, what will that do that they're not doing and, and how does it complement them? So the, the uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, is the ESA ExoMars mission, which is a fantastic rover. I mean, it um, uh, has a, a capability of drilling down below the subsurface far deeper uh, below the surface than, than anything NASA's ever done. And so that gives them an opportunity to bring up material that then go into a variety of instruments, including a part of one instrument um, called MoMA that NASA built. And so uh, we're going to be looking for organics. We're going to be looking for, you know, potential um, uh, environments that could be habitable and try to understand what it's like uh, below the surface at depth, several meters. You know, I think it can go down up to five meters. And so um, uh, it is a huge leap um, uh, in terms of now beginning to interrogate uh, that sub uh, subterranean areas. We've got a question about the wheel, a couple of questions about the wheels. Um, of the rover and I know there's particular kind of things you have to think about when you're when you're designing the wheels of the rovers can you tell us a little bit more about um I mean either you or Jim or Sophia about the, the wheels do you yeah. want to start or do you want me to or <laughs> have at it all right well, can, so yeah yeah you know all about the curiosity <laughs> wheels let's start with those <laughs> yeah so curiosity's wheels um like we were talking about before they have jpl written in morse code on the wheels and um in case anyone missed it that's for what we call vis visual odometry so if we're driving through a really sandy terrain um the way that we usually see if we slipped is we take pictures of the ground as we move and so if a rock went instead of going from in front of us to next to us it went way off to the side we know we've slipped but if we're in a really sandy terrain, we don't have anything that we can really take pictures of to see how far we've slipped. So uh, visual odometry helps us because all the tracks that the wheels make in the sand can then be used as a known distance. So if we go and take pictures of the wheel marks in the sand behind us, 
then we can say, well, we know that one wheel rotation is going to be that far. And then we can calibrate ourselves to, well, if the wheel track went down and it should have been going this way, then we know that this uh, spot on the surface should be further away than it is or closer than it is. And so that's how we can use that. And of course it says JPL over and over now, all over Mars. But one thing with Curiosity's wheels is that um, it's a older rover now. We're getting into, um, I think our eighth year. So it's um, the, the wheels as we've driven over all these really hard rocks and you know some of them have iron in them, things like that. You can imagine if you're constantly pushing a one ton robot on six points that are made of, you know, a pretty thin metal material, eventually they're going to start breaking down. And that's what we've started seeing. So, you know, despite our best efforts to put the wheels in really smooth locations, that's not always possible. So we have, um, some of you might have seen that we inspect our wheels periodically with Molly. So we take the robotic arm and take all these pictures of them. And um, we have found some holes in the wheels. And so we're doing our best to keep the wheels from breaking down for as long as possible. And we do have a contingency plan. If one does break down, we actually have a way to break off the broken part and keep driving on the rims. So we're, we're good to go for a while. But um, yeah, the other thing about Curiosity's wheels is that they do shed a little bit of their material as they break down. So that's changed how we can pick what locations on Mars we drill on. Because if we drive over a rock and all of the wheels might have you know, shed some of their metal, then we don't want to go back and drill that spot because we know that maybe the wheels have contaminated it. So that's had to change a little bit of how we pick which rocks we want to investigate. We have to be a bit more careful about where we put things. So um, having seen all of that, you know, development with Curiosity's wheels, I'll let Jim talk about uh, Perseverance's wheels. Well, just to finish up on Curiosity, as, as it was just mentioned, we started puncturing holes in them. And of course, the, the, as it rolls around, it can tear. This is why the treads and how the treads were aligned were so important. And so when I was head of planetary, I was getting, you know, weekly reports on uh, what's happening with the wheels, you know, <laughs> because we were so worried about it. So we knew uh, as we started the process of um, uh, using the basic design of uh, Curiosity for Perseverance that we were going to have to beef up the wheels. And indeed, uh, JPL came up with um, a stronger wheel. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I, think, I think the wheels are a little smaller, but they're thicker. Okay. Uh, uh, I used that whole analogy to, to help push the microphone idea. So, uh, I, you know, uh, the engineering microphone that's currently on uh, Perseverance, I really wanted pretty bad. And, uh, and when you think about it, it can, it can uh, indeed tell us what's happening. You know, as we listen to the sounds of the rover moving uh, and we get used to how it moves, you know, now we might be able to hear if rocks are actually puncturing the wheels. You know, if there's, if there's new problems, if their creaking doesn't sound quite right, you know, it may indicate something's wearing out. So we want to use sound also as a, a, to give us a heads up on, on how the rover is operating. Okay, I'm just going to look through. We've still got a few more questions on the chat. Um, a question for Sophia about, mm -hmm. uh, would you consider your job to be a difficult job? Is it a hard job? Um, some ways, yes. Some ways, no. I mean, it, it's difficult, but I love it. So <laughs> um, it's very, it, it, it can be pretty taxing if it's a really complex day, because um, especially now that we work from home, I actually drive the rover from where I'm sitting right here in my apartment. Um, I will have one conversation with the rover planners in this year and another conversation with the science team and the rest of the robotic team in this year, and even sometimes a third conversation with the strategic team just, you know, on the speakers of my computer. And I have to be able to listen to everything all at once. And we're trying to simulate what we would do if we were on the lab, which is have all these conversations in the same room together. So I'm a little bit used to listening to multiple conversations at once, but definitely in different years, it's difficult. But anyway, um, so having that skill of being able to do work on a tight timeline, make sure that I'm getting all the details right that keeps the rover safe, while also listening to what might be coming down the pipeline from the science team for us to do so I can make sure I'm prepared for that. 
versus the rover team discussing why did you decide that we were okay with two visual odometry failures, let's do three, and having that discussion while I'm also trying to code all these Molly images we wanna take, it can be a lot, but um, at the end of the day, it's always really satisfying to see everything get packaged up. And then when the downlink comes down the next day, seeing all of the information that you were able to help the science team get to make these really cool discoveries on Mars, um, that just makes it totally worth it. Yeah, but there's one more really amazing thing that she hasn't mentioned. And that is, she's on Mars time. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, you Oh, you got out of it, huh? <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the strategic team on um, Perseverance. I'm oh, you're so lucky. Team. You're so lucky. Well, <laughs> did you mention what it's like to be on Mars time? Um, I talked about that a little bit, but I can oh, touch on it again. Early on? Yeah, okay. so Mars uh, that... time um, is, Mars, of course, is a different size planet. It rotates at a different rate. So um, Mars days are roughly 40 minutes longer than Earth days. And so what that translates to is that once we land the rover on Mars, of course, you have the time zone that the rover lands in. So you have to sync yourself to that. And then on top of that, um, every day on Earth, if you're trying to wake up and fall asleep with the rover, you have to shift your Earth day 40 minutes into the future. So you wake up 40 minutes later and go to bed 40 minutes later every day. Um, so you can go to work 40 minutes later and come home 40 minutes later every day. And that's not so bad when it starts at, you know, 8 a.m. and then 8.40 and then 9. But after a couple months, it starts to be 9 o'clock at night. You show up at work and then 9.40 and then 10.30. And so that gets a little bit crazy. And um, we only do that for, you know, 90, 100 days usually for prime mission on new rovers. But, I mean, just doing it for that long is very difficult and I am very totally cool. amazed at that the people yeah. who do that and put out this amazing work while they're on that schedule. Yeah, me too, me too. Yeah, that must be quite tough because it's just like <laughs> you change every, it's not just one change, it's changes every day, isn't it? Yeah. So. Right, and you can imagine if you need to run an errand and it's three in the morning when you get home from work, I mean, <laughs> better be at, you know, the 24 hour grocery store because if it's not too bad, <laughs> gotta wait. <laughs> And then kind of linked to that, someone's asking, what, what's the thing you love most about your job? Ooh, um, that's really tough to say. I definitely love all of the people that I get to work with on these missions. It's some of the smartest and just most incredible people that I could ever imagine working with. And, um, and also just the fact that what we're doing has, you know, such a larger purpose than just us. We're forwarding because you know humans have always wanted to explore we've explored our way all over these different continents we've explored our way into space and now we're exploring all these different planets and so it just feels like I'm kind of helping that push that humans have kind of always done to just ask the big questions about what happened why were we here what was going on 3.8 million years ago in these craters and um, to be able to be a part of that is just incredible so what about well, you, Jim? If, same, well, same question to you. Yes. Uh, so for me, uh, what I dearly love is I get to see uh, several aspects of the agency, not only uh, the, re the absolutely remarkable engineering that is pulled off on a daily basis, but also the kind of science activity that's going on. You know, so I try to stay up with uh, 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 new discoveries in earth science, new discoveries in astrophysics, new discoveries about the sun, and then of course uh, planetary sciences, uh, you know, I'm, I'm inundated with all the new things that are that are going on there. So I really love the diversity of science that NASA is involved in, and I, I just can't beat the position I'm in to get inundated with that. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim and Sophia. I think we could probably go on and on with the questions, but... Um... <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, there's one more question that I've had my eye on and okay. I wanted to answer. So everybody always asks about the rover singing itself happy birthday on Mars. And the, so Curiosity did try that for its first birthday. We have an instrument called SAM, which is like a little oven that's inside the rover's body. And it can vibrate at different frequencies. And that's usually used to like move sample around inside the instrument. And um, of course, what different vibrational frequencies will sound like to human ears is notes. So somebody mapped the frequencies of shaking around Sam to happy birthday 
And then on Curiosity's first birthday, it started to sing itself happy birthday. But unfortunately, it only got a few notes in before the instrument said something crazy is happening and I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Marked itself as sick and stopped. So we haven't been able to do it again because the instrument said you can't just sing yourself happy birthday and, you know, make the instrument freak out. That's not OK. So <laughs> yeah, that's that story. That's a nice that story. A yeah. story. <laughs> OK, we, we will we'll end there. But uh, thank All you right. both. Um, and if Dallas and Susie are, are now on a, another link that you can find on, on marsday.org.uk uh, at the Space Rocks um, session that they're doing, they're already 10 minutes into that. So people that want even more space can go to that link. Uh, but thank you again. And thanks thank everyone you. for joining. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.